graft versus host disease looks like. And this is a patient with lichen planus, which is a manifestation of chronic graft versus host disease. Now, GVHD was first observed in 1956 by two people. It was Barnes and Lutit. They were doing irradiation experiments in mice. And they, they were taking spleen from a litter mate and putting it into the totally irradiated mouse. And after a few weeks, this mouse started losing its hair, started having diarrhea, and losing weight. And they called this disease secondary disease because it came along with the engraftment, right? And it's actually called runt disease in the mouse. In 1966, Billingham postulated three crucial requirements for the development of GVHD. The transplanted graft must contain immunologically competent cells. Two, the recipient must be incapable of rejecting or eliminating the transplanted cells. Three, the recipient must express tissue antigens that are not present in the transplant donor. Thus, the recipient antigens are recognized as foreign by the donor cells. These three caveats remain true for graft versus host disease. You have to have an immunocompetent cell from the donor which recognizes some difference in the recipient and mounts an immune attack on the recipient's cells. So that's the hallmark of graft versus host disease. Now, in terms of pathophysiology, traditionally now we are talking of a three-step model. The first is that your conditioning causes tissue damage. This tissue damage results in activation of the recipient's antigen-presenting cells. This is called the afferent phase, where the donor T cells are now stimulated to recognize the recipient, to recognize the differences. And the third is the attack phase, or the efferent phase, where the donor T cells now go to town on the recipient. So this is traditionally some sort of priming occurs. Then there is an afferent phase where the donor T cells are stimulated. And there is an efferent phase where the donor T cells begin to attack and produce apoptosis. Now anybody who today gives you a talk on GVHD will have this slide. So it's an extremely common slide. But it illustrates the phases. So this is conditioning-induced damage, mainly to the skin and the intestine, which upregulates all your cytokines, IL-1, and LPS from bacteria, which stimulates host antigen-presenting cells, which present new antigens in class 1 or class 2 to the donor T cells. This results in an expansion of Thi-1, not so commonly Thi-2 cells. And the Thi-1 has two subsets of cells, the CD4, CD8 cells. And these cells go to town on the tissues of the recipient, be it keratinocyte, be it whatever. And this target produces significant damage to various tissues, which I'll tell you in a minute. Now, this is an understanding that, in fact, the intestine is one of the main agents which triggers graft-versus-host disease because radiation or chemotherapy-induced damage allows various products of bacterial lipopolysaccharide. These are called DAMPs and PAMPs. This is a pathogen-associated molecular pattern which is set up. This stimulates the host antigen-presenting cell, upregulates the immune system. If you have a patient who comes in, clean, healthy, thalassemic kid, and some person in your team introduces sepsis when the catheter is put in, 
you are starting off with an immune system in the recipient which has already been triggered. So what's really nice is to get your patient into transplant afebrile well without any sepsis on board. Now this is a skin biopsy of a, it's actually not from a human being, but it's an experimental GVHD. And just look here, right? An ordinary person would look at this and says, there's nothing wrong here. So in fact, I also used to be amazed when I used to go to the pathology department to look at my patient specimen. You would imagine there's huge lymphoid infiltrate in the skin. In fact, you've got to look hard to find lymphocytes in the skin, right? This is grade one. You can see that the epidermis is here like this, and you can see that there's hardly any inflammatory cell. If you look carefully, you will see a satellite cell going and sticking on to the basal layer of the epithelium. And the, but you look at your patient, he's red all over a Th2 response. Now the Th1 response is the one which is actually cytotoxic and damaging. A Thi2 response is actually protective. Now this is a subgroup of cells which we're becoming increasingly interested in. They are CD4, FOXP3 positive cells, and these are the T regs. And we believe that if you have a substantial number of T regs, these regs can actually abrogate graft versus host disease. These are the CD8 subsets which actually respond to HLA class 1 antigens, and this is a list. Now, these are the receptors on a T cell which decide whether the cell is going to attack or it's not going to attack. And this cartoon now is increasingly familiar to all of you because this is the basis of our new immunotherapies. Obviously, you don't want to use any of these sort of agents in graft-versus-host disease because there you want to blunt the response. You don't want to allow the T cells to attack like you want when you use as an immunotherapy for cancer. Now, one of the hallmarks of uh, allogeneic transplant is that the cure is not dependent on the intensity of chemotherapy that you give in order to prepare the patient for the transplant. So we now know that, in fact, what is much more important is the donor's attack against residual tumor cells in the recipient. We call this graft versus leukemia. Now, almost always, graft versus host disease is associated with graft versus leukemia. And it was Horowitz from the NMDP who first showed that relapse after allogeneic transplant is less, is greater in those who had a T cell depleted graft. Today, nobody does traditional T cell depletion because relapse is increased. Bacigalupo showed that, in fact, the more intense your immunosuppression to suppress GVHD, there's more relapse. Kolb from Germany is the first to tell us that, in fact, you can rescue a patient after transplant just by infusing donor T lymphocytes. And this is what we call DLI. There's a strong association between chronic GVHD and a reduction in relapse, and this was first demonstrated by Valkert cell. Now, can we separate GVH and GVL? This is one of the things we'd love to do, to try and separate GVH from GVL. And I would say that currently, we do not have good ways of separating GVH from GVL. Now, this is a paper, so it was in transplantation, and they are saying that the type of response that the T cell produces in graft versus host disease versus graft versus tumor is different 
and that it may be possible to manipulate this difference to our benefit to try and get GVL without getting GVHD. Now having said something about the biology of graft versus host disease, you'll have to keep time for me. Eh? You can tell me when to stop. Prevention of graft versus host disease is the most important thing. It's like a horse where you've left the barn door open. Once the horse has bolted, trying to get it back is not easy. So traditionally, we have used cyclosporin and methotrexate as our preventive strategy for graft versus host disease. So you notice the methotrexate is given on day one, three, six, and 11. And this was the traditional dose that we used. The idea is methotrexate is a cycle-specific drug. As soon as you've put in the graft, the donor T cells are going to recognize, hey, this guy is different, and attack. That involves proliferation. So you have a cell cycle agent which will cut proliferation at that point, and therefore you can abrogate the GVHD. And this combination of cyclosporin and GVHD was first developed by the Seattle team where Don Thomas worked, and it was Reiner Straub who actually popularized this approach. So you use a calcineurin inhibitor, which you start on day minus one or minus three, and you give methotrexate on day one, three, six, and 11. This sort of blunts the proliferative response of T cells, which are now beginning to react to the recipient's antigens. Okay, now what can we do to prevent the T cells from recognizing the recipient as foreign and attacking, right? Now this issue came to the forefront when we wanted to do mismatched transplants. I don't have a donor for this patient. I want to do a half-matched transplant, right? So what did they do? They said, let's collect a huge number of CD34 cells. So we get a veto effect by increasing the number, a tenfold increase in CD34. Two, let's deplete the T cells in the graft so that whatever T cells come, come afterwards when the stem cell is beginning to undergo lymphogenesis and produce new T cells. So this was the approach that was taken, and this was how T cell depleted transplantation in the haplo situation was developed by Handgrettinger in Tübingen and Aversa. These two people worked very hard on this protocol, and they worked on T cell depletion, and they could do this in many ways. Today, the best way of doing this is using a system like this, developed by Militini, so you collect your product, which is either peripheral blood or bone marrow. You then add an antibody to the stem cell, which can be a CD34 antibody or a CD113 antibody. This is called positive selection. That means you, this antibody has a tiny mag iron particle attached to it. Sounds so elegant, no? So put this antibody, which has an iron particle, into this bag of marrow or peripheral blood stem cells. And then you put it down, and simple, you've got a magnet over here, right? So as this product is coming down, the cells which have a iron particle attached to it will stay in the magnet inside a closed sterile system, and all the junk will come off. Then you release the electromagnetic force, put a buffer through the top, and you collect a product which has 98% purified stem cells, which is CD34 positive or 113 positive. Now the other way of doing this thing, I don't want to touch the stem cell in case I may damage it. Let's take off all the cells which are not wanted. And this is called negative selection, and you do it by removing T and B cells, 
but leaving the NK cell. You know that your NK cell is responsive to innate immunity, responsible for your innate immunity. Don't take it off. And if you don't take it off, you won't affect that much the T cell reconstitution, and you will have GVL because the NK cell is important in GVL. So this is what they did, and this is experience from Perugia. And you can see that, if you look at this, you can see that the non-relapse mortality was as high as 40%. So you technically got a graft in. You engrafted. You didn't have too much GVHD. But because immune reconstitution didn't happen, your patient died of all sorts of other complications. So this approach, in fact, is not so popular now, though some groups still persist with this. So what is the holy grail? Can we put in stem cells, yet block T cells, which are only going to respond to host antigens? and not to CMV and all the other things, right? And this was something we believed was not possible. And the first people to suggest that this is possible was the group from Johns Hopkins. Ephraim Fuchs is the guy who really took this forward, right? And here, what do you do? You condition the patient with very low intensity conditioning, just some flodarabine and one tiny little dose of cyclophosphamide and a non-ablative dose of TBI, 200 centigrade. And then what you do is, on day three and day four, you give a massive dose of cyclophosphamide, 50 milligram per kilogram body weight, right? Now, one of the beauties of cyclophosphamide is the stem cell does not have aldehyde dehydrogenase. So it cannot activate cyclophosphamide. So it doesn't damage the stem cell, right? It's a brilliant idea, actually, if you think about it. Now, which are the cells that are going to be dividing massively on day three and four? It's T cells of the donor, which have seen the difference in the recipient's HLA or minor antigens, and are now proliferating in order to start an immune attack on the recipient. Hit them on the head with cyclophosphamide, right? Now, I never really thought this would work as beautifully as it does, but Naveen is going to tell you all the bad things about this, or maybe the good things also. But I'm actually sold on this idea. And in fact, my group is saying, why are we doing methotrexate cyclosporin as GVH prophylaxis? Let's go to cyclophosphamide, MMF, tacrolimus, right? The advantage of this prophylaxis is there's no methotrexate, there's no mucositis, or there's very little mucositis, right? Fludarabin doesn't cause mucositis. This doesn't cause, 200 centigrade doesn't. So your patient is not, troubled by severe mucositis, right? So it's, an, it's, a, it's a really beautiful idea which the Johns Hopkins group has told us. How to try and kill T cells which are responding to recipient antigens, but not killing the memory cells against CMV, TB, adeno, BK. Those fellows, you leave them alone because they have not started proliferating or undergoing blast transformation in response to the new antigens that the cells are seeing. And this cartoon illustrates exactly that in a beautiful way. Right? And this is what I told you yesterday, which I'm just saying to show that in refractory Hodgkin's disease, this is matched related, matched unrelated, and haploidentical. Small numbers, I agree, but you look at this. Progression-free survival, haploidentical, is 51%, right? Now, we will give you a slide to refute this, I'm sure. But this is an amazing thing, no? Much better, double, match-related, right? So, Naveen, where's the question of using a match-related donor, right? And you look at the graft-versus-host disease, which is what you'd be worrying about. Look here. 
16%, right? Somebody must do this in a larger number. We've done a few and we are really enthusiastic about this, right? So a totally different way of approaching prevention of graft-versus-host disease, saying I'm not going to T-cell deplete by traditional methods and have all the problems that I have. I'm not going to give methotrexate cyclosporine. I'm going to hit the T-cells after I put them when they are beginning to respond to the host antigens, right? And the beauty is that immune reconstitution occurs well and the sort of sepsis TRM that you had. Relapse is still a problem, but TRM has significantly come down with this approach. What are the clinical features of GVHD? Fever, in fact, when my graft is coming in and the patient starts having fever, that's when I really worry. I just hate this because it may be that he's going to, but the main target organs of acute GVHD are skin, liver, and intestine. And most often, these target organs are affected when engraftment occurs. But there is a problem where to separate the engraftment syndrome, as the white cell count is beginning to recover, you can have fever, you can have redness, you can have diarrhea. And to distinguish between the engraftment syndrome from early acute GVHD is not easy. There is sometimes a phenomenon called hyperacute GVHD. Your graft has not come in. Your donor T cells have already started attacking recipient organs. Bilirubin is climbing even before the graft has come in, right? And this is what I refer to as hyperacute GVHD. How do you diagnose it? It is always in the context of a clinical situation that you make a diagnosis of graft versus host disease. I had a patient, she was the daughter of a judge in the high court. She had Hodgkin's disease. At the end of her sixth cycle, she HB fell to six grams and she was transfused two units of pack cells outside, not in my hospital. She came back to me 10 days later with diarrhea, pancytopenia, and jaundice. Diagnosis? Transfusion, graft versus host disease. Okay? So that is one disease where GVHD occurs and it destroys the bone marrow. In fact, the counts will fall to 100. So there, it is a mismatched graft that is being put in into a recipient and causing this. So transfusion GVHD is totally different from the GVHD which we see in allogeneic stem cell transplant. Now, diagnosis is not easy. I'll tell you it's quite difficult, right? And very often, a biopsy is not possible. Your patient is day 20, he's grafted, his bilirubin is 14, his quags are off, you're not able to get a platelet count up. It's very hard to do a liver biopsy. So you will have to assume that it is GVHD. And then you struggle, is it VOD, is it this, is it that? Is it graft versus host disease, right? Now, chronic graft versus host disease is a different disease altogether. It's like scleroderma, right? Dispigmentation, lichen planus, GI involvement, difficulty in swallowing, restrictive lung disease, cardiomyopathy, dry eyes, dry mouth. These are the features of chronic GVHD, and it's very, very similar to uh, scleroderma. I have one of my first matched undulated transplants, right? It was a second computer engineer working with IBM. He did a mud transplant. The donor was from the US. You should see him now, you know. He's now 10 years post-transplant. His skin is a mess. He's got contractures, no matter what I do. But you know, the courage of this young man is amazing. He still goes to work. He still does everything that you or I would do. But his life is quite difficult. So GVHD is, so that's why when Rahul Yar said, yes, transplant, no? You see one patient whom you've done this to. 
and you say, my God, what have I done, right? So a transplanter who is gung-ho is not somebody you would trust. A transplanter who really thinks 20 times before he takes you for transplant is the guy whom you want to be with, right? What is the treatment of GVHD? How many minutes more do I have here? Four minutes, five minutes? Five minutes, okay. Immunosuppressive drugs, this is the repertoire of drugs that we have, which I won't waste your time about. Sorry, what have I done? It's gone out. Hmm? Okay. So this is the list of drugs that we have, and I won't waste your time about it. I don't know what's happening here. No? And this again is a cartoon showing how at different points of the immune response you can block it, right? So what is the treatment of GVHD? Day 14, the graft has come in, you're rejoicing, and the patient starts having diarrhea. It's one liter of stool, liquid stool. The skin is looking red, and his bilirubin has jumped to four. You've made a diagnosis of acute graft versus host disease. What do you do? Your first line in the management is steroids, right? Now, there is no data to show that going to mega doses is of any help at all. In fact, it's detrimental. So the max dose, if it's grade 3 or 4, is 2 milligram per kg of methylprednisolone. If it is grade 2, grade 1, you won't start treatment, actually, right? If it's grade 2, you may use 1 milligram per kg of methylprednisolone. Continue your cyclosporine, OK? Little kid, he's thal, he's post-transplant, he's day 30, and he's developed graft-versus-host disease. You've started steroid. The cyclosporine is still IV, and you're called to the ward saying that he's got seizure. What's your diagnosis? Huh? Press. OK, no press. Simpler diagnosis. Hypertensive encephalopathy, OK? In, you know, in my first, I, I did a baby who was five kilogram body weight. The father was a chartered accountant. I said, please go. I can't touch a five kg baby. I have no experience, right? Father went to a temple outside Velour. In Ratnagiri, there is a Samyar who doesn't speak, right? So he wrote on a slate, patient will be transplanted in Velour and will survive. So the father came back and said, what is this? He said, no, no, I have made up my mind. Either you do or I'll take my child home. So it was a Viscott Aldrich. And when father was supremely confident. After all, Samyar has said he's going to survive, no? So came to the ward. This was a 5 kg baby, right? Checking blood pressure in a 5 kg baby is very, very hard. And my pediatricians were not aware of hypertensive encephalopathy with cyclosporine, right? So you go take the BP yourself, make the diagnosis. So when you start steroids and cyclosporine on, is on board, please remember to be ultra careful about the blood pressure, right? And this just shows that low dose is adequate. Mega doses don't help. They're, in fact, more toxic. Now, when you say that the steroids are not working, if there's no improvement after five days, or there is progression within 72 hours, then you say this is steroid, refractory, graft versus host disease, right? And this is an algorithm as to what you can do. And these are all the agents which are listed here, which are available as second line. And these are the third line options which are available, right? So. This is an algorithm again, which I won't waste your time with. I would add a caution, right? GVHD is by itself immunosuppressive. It's an immune disease. But remember that kids 
with autoimmune disease die of immune failure. So the immune system targets something, but it leaves everything else alone. The good things that it's supposed to do, it doesn't do, right? So GVH by itself is an immunosuppressive disease. Second, that when you treat GVH with steroids, with all your other agents, you are a sitting duck for infection. I had a patient whose insurance was paid from, the Euro from Europe. Total cost of transplant, 1.3 crores, right? I struggled with him for eight months with graft-versus-host disease, right? He suddenly developed pain in the right flank. We did an MR, it showed that the kidney was not functioning. What's your diagnosis? Pain in the right flank, kidney not functioning. He's got graft versus host disease, he's had etanercept, he's had rictolipnib, he's had ibrutinib, he's had OTG, he's had everything you can think of. Diagnosis, right? Something which goes in the blood vessels and blocks the blood vessels. Mucus. Very good, mucus, right? We took him to surgery and the nephrologist, uh, urologist brought out the kidney to show me. It was a bag of mucus. He split open the kidney. Literally the whole kidney was full of mucus, right? So please remember that when you have GVHD, what kills the patient is often infection. What do you have to worry about? Bacterial for sure, viral, herpes, adeno, CMV, BK, JC, all these. And always GVHD will be associated with cytomegalovirus, with BK virus. You can't get the platelet count up. That's a nightmare, okay? Fungal infection, right? And this is a case I illustrated. Now, there must be constant surveillance for infection. Supportive care. To look after a patient with grade 4 graft versus host disease, right? If I come to the transplant unit and see that this patient is having diarrhea every half an hour, yet his sheets are clean, he's clean, he's looked after, that's the hallmark of great nursing inside the transplant room, right? The test of your transplant nurse is when you have grade 4 GVHD and still you can come in and see the patient looking clean and neat and looked after. Right? It's not easy. Okay. Right? And if you're starting a transplant unit, Ajay will tell you, you please have huge amounts of linen if you're going to have GVHD. Today, fortunately, we have these nice big diapers, so you don't have to change the linen that much. Right? What are the agents for steroid refractory GVHD? I'm not going to go through this list, but just to tell you, we have lots of them. And very often, all of these fellows don't work, right? ATG, anti-TNF-alpha, infliximab, and etanercept. We have interleukin-2 antibodies, daclizumab, which has been taken off, basiliximab. And today we have an agent which is a little bit specific. Vidulizumab acts on the integrin receptor in the intestine. Therefore, it's not a pan T-cell blocker. It goes and hits only the upregulated receptor on the intestine. But one patient has done brilliantly with vedolizumab, right? These are all the small molecules which are available. Mycophenolate, serolimus, ibrutinib, ruxolitinib, right? It was Katrina LeBlanc in Sweden who first showed us that mesenchymal cells might work. We started a program in law, and to tell you the truth, I'm not impressed, right? Phototherapy, does that work? Now this is the integrin alpha-4 beta-7 steroid receptor. In steroid refractory GVHD, this is an intestinal receptor which is blocked by vedolizumab. So increasingly, these drugs are coming along. Your bill is already 60 lakhs. Your patient has got grade 4 graft versus host disease. You want to spend another 6 lakhs on this. It becomes tough. Every day you're looking at the bills, you're looking at the cost, where's the money going to come from, how are you going to do all these things, right? So yesterday you had a massive discussion on knowing when to stop, right? Now this is a word about photophoresis, right? Now I used to think that 
photosynthesis works by just destroying T cells. It's not true, right? There are two technologies for this. One is photosynthesis, which is intermittent, and this is the macropharma machine. You connect, collect the cells, like we're using an ordinary cell separator. You, these, you use a lymphocyte collection protocol, and then you take these cells, you add methyl sorolin, which is the photosensitizer, and then you stick it into this UV chamber, and then that should be it, no? But you have to return the cells, right? Not just take it out and expose it. We've just got the macropharma. It was sitting in Delhi for one year. It was not used by anybody in Delhi, so they decided they'll be happily put it with us because they didn't charge for the machine. But it cost 65,000 rupees for the kit alone. It's a simple bag. And the sorolin really costs nothing, right? But it will end up costing one lakh for one photosynthesis, right? We've got a patient now who can afford, who's now had 25, 26 sessions, who's doing well on photosynthesis, right? And this is the other way of doing photosynthesis. This is the Theracos system, which is a continuous flow system. It's like a cell separator. You separate the lymphocytes, you add methyl sorolin, you expose it to UV, and then return the cells to the recipient. And this is the biology of how the apoptotic T cells, when they are returned, suppress the immune response, right? And this is what is seen there. Now, just a word in passing about fecal transplantation. Four patients in Japan. See, by the time you've got grade four GVHT and you've been on all sorts of antibiotics, your intestinal flora is totally changed, right? And this is a Japanese group who actually used a fecal transplant and in all four patients responded and three actually went into remission with the fecal transplant. So we have to think out of the box when we're dealing with graft versus host disease. Management of chronic GVHD is a much more difficult task, right? Here, this patient is going to be yours for the rest of his life, and he's going to come to you because he still trusts you. You've got to take him through this disease and help him to live with this disease. This is very, very tough, right? And you've got to be really dedicated, use everybody in your team to try and make the quality of life of this patient as best as possible. So in conclusion, graft versus host disease is the bugbear of allogeneic stem cell transplant. And I know that there are certain individuals who will not do transplant because they just cannot manage the psychological trauma of looking at a patient who's dying of acute GVHD 